a lot of babysitters as a kid, and I think a lot of kids probably do, and a majority of them probably didn't have the best experience with their babysitters. And I think being a babysitter in general is a pretty difficult job, but some people who do it are just not okay. So let's take a walk down my memory lane. There was Rosie, Avery, Rebecca, and Jenny, not necessarily in that order. I had Avery when I was about five or six years old, and she was a teenager, it was the late 80s, and those Freddy Krueger movies were all the rage. Avery and her friends knew that we were terrified of Freddy, especially me. I was absolutely terrified of Freddy Krueger. So my punishment, if I was being punished, would be to watch some scenes from those movies. Because, you know, traumatizing kids is totally a normal thing to do when you're a babysitter. There was one day I was supposed to be napping, but I found a bottle of baby powder and went absolutely insane with it. I just kept squeezing the bottle to watch the powder clouds explode out. I was very easily amused, apparently. And there was white powder everywhere. It looked like a scene from Scarface. I got in so much trouble, I had to watch a whole scary movie as punishment. Honestly, I don't think Avery babysat me for very long. It was just one of those one-offs here and there. When I was seven, I was babysat by a woman named Rosie. I was best friends with Rosie's daughter, Anita, and Anita had these huge dreams of being a famous movie star or a singer, and she was really serious about this for a little kid. Rosie took Anita to do all kinds of stuff, dance auditions, voice auditions. If there was an audition for it, Anita was there doing it. And she loved it. That was what she wanted. And we lived near St. Louis, and in the early 90s, it was a really happening place for auditions. The Olsen twins had been steadily gaining popularity with Full House, so it was Rosie's dream for Anita to hit that mark. But man, it was so toxic. Anita, even though she was only eight, was already on a strict diet and was terrified of getting fat, which just... It's so sad for an eight-year-old. While the rest of us kids were drinking chocolate milk with our lunches, she was only allowed to either drink water or Crystal Light. And let me tell you, Crystal Light was good stuff. It's Kool-Aid for old people, probably. That should be their tagline. I got sent home early one night from their house because I drank an entire pitcher of Crystal Light while watching the Beverly Hills 90210 debut. But in my defense, I was seven. I didn't want to watch 90210. I didn't care about what these rich teenagers were doing. I wanted to watch Barney and get lit on Grandma's Kool-Aid. The issue, though, with her sending me home early was that it meant I was going to be home by myself at seven years old in St. Louis in a trailer park, which is a horrendous idea. Like, I can you imagine thinking that's a good idea? No, because you have a conscience, hopefully. But the real problem with Rosie didn't start there. It started when Anita had an impromptu audition for a Christmas play, and I was already at their house. So Rosie called my mom and said, hey, is it okay if I take your kid with me to this audition? She can audition too. And my mom was like, sure, go ahead. Long story short, I got a call back for a second audition, and Anita didn't. She didn't make it to round two. After that, shit got real. Rosie would literally force feed me. Spaghetti, ramen noodle, carbs. At first, I was like, oh yeah, I love spaghetti. But it was to the point, it was literally hurting my stomach. Like, I felt like I was going to explode, I was going to throw up. Anita would be allowed to finish her plate and leave the table and go outside and play with the other kids, but I had to sit there and keep eating. One time, she slapped more food on my plate and told me she didn't want to deal with leftovers, so I had to eat it. And then, though she was force-feeding me additional food, she had the audacity to tell my mom that I ate so much that my mom would have to bring additional food on top of the money my mom was already giving her to feed me and babysit me. It was pretty wild. Honestly, at seven, eight years old, I didn't realize that the force-feeding was to literally fatten me up so that I would be of less competition to her daughter. But then Rosie started sending me home really early. And I don't mean just like 10, 15 minutes here and there. It was hours earlier than she should have been sending me. My mom was paying her X amount of dollars per hour and then sending me home, pocketing the money. And you might be thinking, well, why didn't you mention it to your mom? Because honestly, I didn't know I was being sent home early. I thought, okay, maybe my mom told Rosie I'm supposed to go home at 7 and be there until 10 when my mom got home from work. But... I was scared all the time being home by myself. I hated it. A few weeks after 90210 debuted, Nickelodeon dropped Are You Afraid of the Dark, which was amazing. But I was only seven, and that show had me absolutely messed up. Every little sound I heard was an alien, a psychotic clown, a ghost, resurrected grandma. Ugh, Mallory, why didn't you just watch something else if it scared you so bad? 
because I was seven. I didn't have good critical thinking skills. I should not have been home alone. Anita and I would also get into a ton of trouble because we were constantly left alone. And unfortunately, we had just learned what prank calls were. And one day, Anita decided she hated one of the neighborhood girls, and we targeted her and left a ton of absolutely unhinged voice messages on her family's answering machine. You're ugly. You're disgusting. I'm going to kill you. Give me $200. Mind you, we were like seven and eight. Again, no critical thinking skills. Of course, these were easily traced back to us. It, like, duh. It was our voices. They, we, we were doing, like, almost nothing to try to mask who we were. So both of my mom's parents were police officers. So her very first thought when her seven-year-old was dabbling in crime was, I'm taking that kid to the police. <laughs> So she took me to the police station and had an officer talk to me about how prank calls are a form of harassment and therefore illegal, and I could possibly go to jail and ruin my entire life. And as much as I would like to say I never made another prank call, in 1999, when I turned 16, Bonzi Buddy was released. And let's just say, when you hear a robotic parrot absolutely eviscerate someone, it is worth whatever penalty of law there could be. Anyway, my mom told Rosie about my punishment. Rosie told her she didn't punish Anita at all. And my mom was really shocked by the leniency. Rosie said it was because they had plans to go see a movie and if she punished Anita, it also meant she was punishing herself. Solid parenting. Mom and I moved away from the trailer park in 1993. In 2007 on MySpace, Anita found me and told me about her life and she did it. She was living in Hollywood and actually got a part on a reality show. She changed her name and she was living the exact life she always wanted to. She had big dreams and she went out and got them and I gotta admire that. Good for you, Anita. When I was even younger, around four years old, my mom had started going to a trade school during the day. And on the way to this trade school, there was an old lady named Jenny who babysat a bunch of kids. So it was perfect because my mom could drop me off on her way and pick me up on her way back. It was awesome. Except for the part where Jenny was one of those incredibly old religious nut jobs that believed left-handed people were demonic. Yep, that, that was a thing. I think it might still be a thing. I don't know. But I was a budding lefty, and Jenny lost her mind about it. She would constantly make me start writing with my right hand. And I'd like to say as a result, I'm ambidextrous, but I'm not. I'm 100% right-handed. But this left-handed business had Jenny shook. She would lock me in the bathroom and encourage the other kids to yell at me through the door and call me names. It was bizarre. When my mom was little, she had a friend named Rebecca. She and Rebecca were literally two days apart in age. They went to the same school together for several years, and the way my mom tells it, Rebecca was pretty clingy and a bit toxic in her youth, which is pretty normal for a lot of teenage girls. If my mom started to make new friends, Rebecca would get jealous and try to convince my mom not to hang out with them, or would tell the other people my mom was too busy to go anywhere with them. It was a whole thing. Rebecca had some like low self-esteem issues, and quite frankly, a lot of girls go through that. But rather than growing out of those issues, Rebecca got a lot worse as she got older. The clinginess and jealousy that she had grew into something a lot darker. My mom got married when she was about 17 and had me at 18, so when I was around 6, my mom got a job and Rebecca started babysitting me. Rebecca would have been around 24 at this time, so the prefrontal cortex wasn't quite finished yet, let's say. But a 24-year-old definitely knows better. You'll see what I mean soon. Rebecca babysat a few other kids my age. There were these two sisters and then another only child like me. They were treated very differently, though. If I chewed with my mouth open, I would get slapped across the face. When it was nap time, the other kids got to sleep in the big bed together, and I had to sleep on the floor in the closet. Even weirder, she would stand there and watch me. If I opened my eyes, she would hit me. Sometimes she'd make it sound like she, she'd close the closet door, and then if I opened my eyes, she'd hit me again. When it was playtime, I was not allowed to talk and had to sit and watch TV, which generally wasn't that bad because I got to watch MTV's Night Tracks, which was awesome. Anyway, yeah, I thought I was a bad kid, and that's why I was always being punished. The other kids were good kids, and they got to do normal kid things. One day, I was sitting and watching TV while the other kids played, and Rebecca came barreling out of the bathroom right towards me. She ripped me up by my arm and just beat the ever-loving hell out of me to the point I couldn't breathe because I was crying so hard. And the whole reason? The toilet wasn't flushed. 
It actually turned out her elderly mother, whom she lived with and who was also an absolute angel, hadn't flushed the toilet earlier because it was nap time and she didn't want to disturb any of the sleeping kids. Obviously, my inability to breathe properly after this beating caused some ruckus because even the elderly mother was starting to panic. This was the first time she'd seen what her daughter was actually doing and how little it took to provoke her to attack a child. Rebecca sat me back down in front of Night Tracks and tells me, don't tell your mom. And that's when a new wrinkle was added to my smooth six-year-old brain. Mom didn't know what was really going on in Rebecca's little home daycare. This whole time, I thought my mom knew everything that was happening. That every adult knew everything every other adult was doing. Now I know they're not a hive mind. They're not the Borg. With this new realization, I sat there and waited very patiently for my mom to come pick me up. Rebecca met her at the front door when she arrived, and she was wringing her hands all nervous, probably hoping I wouldn't say anything. But I popped up and say, she hit me. And then it all came out. Rebecca just blurted it all out. It wasn't just a hit. It was a savage beating. She had no good justification for what she had done to me. It wasn't until a few years later I saw some after-school specials about telling a trusted adult about bad things that happened to you so that they could help you. But unfortunately, a lot of kids have parents or guardians in their lives that they should be able to trust, but they can't. The child may also not realize that what's happening to them isn't normal. It's not happening to everyone else. And not all adults know about it. And worse, people that your parents have known their whole lives think that they can trust their kids with someone, and it turns out <coughs> they can't. So what happened with my mom and Rebecca? Well, I don't personally remember because I was a baby. I don't think I ever had to go back to her house to be babysat, but the way my mom tells it, Rebecca would grasp at straws to make her way back into my mom's life. But to also try to isolate her, it was really weird. My mom had actually gotten divorced when I was around three, so when I was around six, she got a boyfriend, and Rebecca would call my mom telling her he was parked at some random woman's house and you should break up with him, when he was literally sitting right there next to my mom. The absolute last time they spoke was when Rebecca showed up at my grandmother's funeral, walked up to my mom, and said, I need to speak with you urgently. And my mom said, is this about my boyfriend? And Rebecca just nodded her head. And my mom said, this is not the time or the place for this. I'm literally burying my mother today. And that was 1989, the last time they spoke. Some people really are clueless. So that ends the babysitter saga. I know there were other babysitters in there somewhere, but they probably just weren't as traumatic, which, yay? Anyway, till next time. Mwah!